Ah, it's there. Picture. I got some pictures because I didn't write anything, because the other thing, I don't collaborate, but I also don't write in time and I didn't write anything. And then I thought I could steal Marcus Meeson's talk because he's not here. That serves him right. And it's all about violence, it's all about things, you know, fuck him, I've stealed his talk. So that's kind of what I'm doing. Um, and it's just a series of uh, unconnected observations because I really, I am the most anti-social person in the world. I really don't, I don't even like, I have to go to an opening tonight at CC, I don't even like going to my own openings. I hate people. Um, <laughs> which is the other thing that I actually realised the title of the talk was wrong. We only came up with 11 o'clock last night, but actually the title of the talk should be People Are No Good. Uh, and that is a much better title. People Are No Good. And it's actually the basis I often work from and believe. Um, yeah, they're just rubbish. Um, <laughs> me being one of the best examples of that. Um, and I am doing what's meant to be a collaborative project at the moment. I'm writing a book for Bookworks. And it's in the Common Objective series, which is edited by Nina Power, and it's all about politics, and it's all about collectives. Only collectives could apply, and I got one of the commissions. Um, but on my own. <laughs> because I am basically working with the dead. So my proposal was that I would work with the dead. I'm training to be a medium. So the, the collective is me and all of the dead. And they accepted that. So I'm writing the book and, you know, to hell with it. <laughs> and it's going well. And the dead are collaborating. So, you know, you may get some messages as we go. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so, but that's what I'm doing. I'm working on that kind of collectivity and where collectivity might be. I've also really fascinated collectivity because people talk, and even this morning, it's all been quite utopian. And, you know, it's wonderful. Um, actually, I think it's terrible. And I really love that terribleness of it. And I really love the grassrootsness of it, the friction, the actual pain in the ass of working with anybody. And even if they come in and they're not sweating and you are, like, that's just annoying to start with. You know, and then they're wearing nicer clothes and they're not, they're not as fat as you are. And it's just like, ah, you know, and now I've got to work with you and pretend, oh, that's a wonderful idea. Oh, that's amazing. No, <laughs> it's not. Um, but you have to sort of work from that basis. And that's the basis most people are working from. Not some wonderful, great, you know, we all love each other. We don't. Um, people are no good. We hate each other. So it's a much better place to start from. At least admit that. And then you can really work with them, you know? They're assholes. You're an asshole. You've got something in common. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is really the way to start. And it's a much more honest position to start from. And it's not going to be nice, and it's not going to be wonderful, and it's not going to be... It's going to be really full of friction. And you're going to just... You know, best collaborations, you just annoy the hell out of the other person. What, what happens if you don't? And I have an example. This is the example. This picture is the example. It's a book. I wrote collaboratively with six other people. Um, we had a, there was a curator, my Abu El Dab. Uh, we were put in a closed pub in Dublin for seven days and asked to write a sci-fi novel within the seven days with a seven day narrative as a homage to Philip K. Dick. And so we had seven days to write the novel. And the first thing you do is you Google novel to find out how long it is. And they're really long, um, <laughs> which is another pain in the ass. And then you got a, you got a 70,000 words or something, or it's not a novel. So you got seven days. So we all wrote the first chapter. We all wrote the first chapter each. And then in the evening, we all sat down and read our first chapters to each other. And what became clear was most of us couldn't write. Um, <laughs> we were chosen because, you know, we dressed well and no one was fat. So, um, yeah, none of us could write. And the, you know, we all wrote differently. So one person wrote only in the present tense. Um, sort of, you know, Mary is sitting there, she is in hospital, she's not well, she is depressed, she is doing this, she's looking across at the Christmas tree. That's really difficult actually to move. <laughs> You're just sitting there going, oh, you know, how do you get to the next bit? What happens next? Because it's all in the present tense. You've got to do it in real life. Other people were really good at kind of, you know, he ran down the stairs, he opened the door, he jumped into the car, he raced across the city, stopped, pulled out a gun and shot someone, raced back, very good at that kind of fast narrative. Other people could only think of things like science fiction things, like why don't we call this thing Fruce and it's kind of clothes that are time dated and then run out after three weeks and you have to buy some new one. That's, people could do stuff like that. Other people are really good at naming things. Um, other people were good at just kind of writing pre-histories of the book that you hadn't written. So 
at the end of the, we all reading our chapters, we had to decide what are we going to do, and we all had to pick uh, roles for the rest of the seven days, basically, and try and figure out how to put that all together, um, which we did, and we actually did write most of this, and eventually we all got onto a groove, and we all knew how to, we were writing a really good sci-fi novel, you know, proper stuff, it looked like a novel, it did all the things a novel's meant to do, and then one of them was Mark Ariel Waller, and we had um, set up a chapter, we had two main characters, one was Edward Crystal, who was in his late 70s, um, quite frail, neoliberal, evil politician, and the other one was Cassandra, who was a kind of mystical uh, person who had visions, and he was kind of much younger. So he came in with his chapter when we were halfway through, and his chapter was all about Cassandra being tortured by Crystal. Um, but suddenly Crystal has a six pack. Um, I only stripped to the waist and he's got a six pack. And we don't know how that happened. And then, um, <laughs> sort of, my name is Cassandra. We are the future, you and I. She looks over to Crystal. This is Mark Earl Waller's text. She sees him upside down, standing inches from her face. There is a definite bulge in his trousers, a large bulge, a clue to the fruits lying beneath. She wants him so much. She strains to get closer, but the ties that bind her are so tight. Cassandra, how can you be so stupid? His godlike cock taunts her as he speaks, so close yet so unattainable. She can feel his warmth and the sweet scent of his rising pheromones. Her taut nipples are pointing skywards and she is growing wet, waiting for their union. Crystal continues to taunt. Cassandra, it is pleasure, a wonderful pleasure to see you at last, but you cannot get in the way of God's plan. The day of rapture is nigh and I am not deluded. This will happen to the chosen ones. <sighs> yeah. I'm afraid, <laughs> I'm afraid to read the rest. I've never said those words in public. <laughs> he cannot resist any longer and rips down his trousers and unleashes his manhood into Cassandra's face. She licks wildly at the growing rod and struggles, I can't even read well, <laughs> erotics is not my strong point, and struggles to receive his beautiful erectile tissue between her inflamed lips. Once in, she swallows him back. He cannot get away now. She caresses him. Uh, lolling her, <laughs> lolling her agile tongue around him, diving into his urethra. I didn't even know you could do that. Whilst moving her lips rhythmically around, she is touching the cock of God, and she is in the vessel of the host of gods. So this, the whole collaboration just kind of ground to a halt at that point. I was like, whoa, whoa, huh? Um, and so <laughs> we didn't know what to do. We we're probably in about day four, and we also knew we were missing three days' narrative. Um, so this is where we got to, and then we realized, actually, we were writing the perfect, boring novel. Like, everything we were doing was right, and we'd all come to a consensus, and the consensus was we all picked the most boring aspect of our personality and threw them into the collaboration, and it was terrible. And his was totally wrong and politically incorrect, and he'd probably nicked it from something he bought in Dublin. I don't know, but everything was wrong about it, but it kind of destabilized the whole process. Um, and we had to start all over again. We realized how wrong we were in the collaboration. So what, we, what you get is a very bad novel, I have to say. Um, very expensive bad novel. Um, but we kind of learned an awful lot about the collaboration through that. And when we did finish it and we did sort of incorporate those things, and then it all kind of loosened up and it all went crazy because you had nothing to lose at that point because he'd already ruined it. And once you'd ruined it, then you could mess around with it. So it kind of took that kind of messing things up, that kind of evil, nasty, people are no good approach, to actually do something with it. And that, that was what was quite useful. Um, and it was kind of political as well, I think, in its own way, in terms of destabilizing everything that was meant to happen. The proper art project, us making art, like little pompous people sitting at a bar making art. And suddenly we were making crap. And once you're making crap, then you can just get on with it. So then it became quite interesting. Um, so we all still work together, but seven years later, we're all working together. We're all doing things. We're all still working with each other. So that was quite useful as a kind of thing. Well, there was another thing. Let's try this. Exciting. Yeah. So you can see all the names of all the collaborators there for their sins. Uh, Who's the neoliberal? Well, the neoliberal is fictional. All right. It's fiction. We were making it up. <laughs> Though, if you want, you know. <laughs> probably, probably me. <laughs> Is the neoliberal in that? Um, no, it was, yeah, and it was all very politically correct then, couldn't be. So I thought that was useful. And after that, I haven't really collaborated again, I just thought, 
that. No, <laughs> no more of that. I ended up at CCA, so maybe that's partly why I'm here, and that's the more serious. But I ended up at CCA. CCA didn't work. It was broke, and again, it was very distant, and it was very curatorially to itself, and everything was curatorially branded, and everything was in this whole role of the curator is everything, the institution is everything. There wasn't enough money to sustain that kind of bullshit position. So in a way, what we did was reduce that and say, well, everybody else can work here if they want, and try to give the space away as much as we could so other people could work there with other curatorial positions and alternative ways of working. So that's kind of how we're trying to set it up now. And it's only got so far. Uh, there's a whole lot of reasons. Territory still coming into that. People not wanting to give up sort of the individual genius side of it. How to actually make that work. How to not to get ripped off by other people who will use that but don't respect it. All of those kind of things are all kind of balanced against each other. Um, but the model is that we're trying to make it collaborative. We're trying to make it open and basing it around open source and the whole ideology of open source, which I've always liked. Um, just from kind of a uh, new media point of view, that notion of a lot of people getting together and making a program which can then be adapted for other people. It still has to work, it still has to have a structure, it has a start, a middle and an end and you adapt it for your own uses. But to try and make an institution work like that seemed to be the challenge. So that's, what, that's how we've tried to set it up now and we still are looking at the model and still looking at the structure and thinking can we keep changing that to go further and then how far can it go? Um, and what does that mean by the time it gets there? Maybe by the time it gets there, we're not there. Um, it becomes much, much more open. But there's nothing to lose, and it's actually brought much more momentum to the place. So it has survived financially because people are willing to fund it because there's a lot of things happening there. There's a lot more people working in it, so it's harder to get rid of it because you've got a lot of allies, because it's everybody else's as well. So if they're shutting down CCA, they're not shutting down CCA, they're shutting down everybody who's using CCA and there's 500 events a year now and they're not us so that gives you a kind of strength in numbers as well which is a different way of operating where you're not operating for yourself you're operating for much more the commons and so if you're shutting it you're shutting the commons and then you're shutting all of those other people not us it doesn't make much difference to us if we're shut but it makes a lot of difference to the other people using the space so the space is actually there for us to facilitate other people and that's the basis we now get funding. We're not funded as CCA, the wonderful artistic organization. We're funded as CCA, the organization that opens the building and coordinates the activity of other people. And that's actually how our funding is described. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do there as well, is work from that point of view. And work from, you know, you can see that, I've just stolen that, like I stole Marcus Meeson's talk, from Transmission, you know, Transmission Gallery, we've been doing that for years. Um, it's not about transmission, it's about setting up a cooperative and keeping it ticking over so the same people aren't there all the time and anyone can come in and do things as well in the membership. It's trying to expand on something like that and trying to work in a different model that doesn't really care so much about the art world maybe as it should. Um, but I think something like transmission has always been a good model. And since we've done the archive for the third eye and the CCA, we've discovered that C uh, transmission basically is never totally explicitly said. I think transmission was set up because Third Eye began to stop showing enough Scottish artists and really went on mission drift and forgot why it existed. And because it forgot why it existed, Scottish artists had nowhere left to show in Glasgow, so they started transmission. So you have to remember why you're actually there and is there any point to you being there? And is there any relevance? And if there isn't, you should just stop or someone should stop you and throw you out. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at there. Just an anecdote from no reason at all. I'm reading Viv Albertine's book from the Slits. She's written a really nice book um, called Close Boys Music Music. Close, close, close. Thank you. <laughs> Collaborative title. <laughs> and that's really good because she does. I've only got halfway through, and halfway through she describes working with Ari Up, who is the lead singer of the Slits, who is much younger than her, 14, 15, and just growing up. And she follows, Ari up follows Viv Albertine around for a year, staring at her, everything she does, when she tries to flirt with a guy, when she tries to play guitar, when she goes and buys a drink. She studies every move. She just sits and stares at her like that for a year. And she sucks up everything in Viv Albertine that she wants, and then kind of spits her out, and then moves on to people who can dance instead. 
and she describes this in real detail over several chapters about how she was just followed by Ari Up and totally freaked out by it and thought of leaving the group several times while Ari Up just studied her and took everything she needed from her and then abandoned her and abandoned the rest. And that's being in a band. <laughs> that's, that's a collaboration. <laughs> you know, that the other person could be sucking everything they need from you <laughs> so they become a better person. And that's perfectly valid. Um, and that, <laughs> which is why she stayed in the band, and she said not only that, her sister had done it a few years earlier as well. Um, so, but it's that thing that these collaborations aren't always wonderful, beautiful things. They're quite, you know, there's a lot of evil in them, and there's a lot of nastiness in them, because we are no good. And that is perfectly normal. And actually, once you sort of know that dynamic, you can actually use that. And I think that's why she stayed in the band because it was still useful. It was still useful to see her grow and to see her steal everything she had. Still made for a good band. So it's about making those kind of choices in a collaboration that are much more, as Marcus Meeson said something about innocence, that are not innocent choices. Forget innocence, forget utopian notion of collaboration. You know, work from that other basis that these aren't based on niceness, but can be really, really useful if you understand that. Um, Oh, I've got some pictures. Uh, this is a picture of an artist space in Puerto Rico. Um, it's called Beta Local, and it's a new space. Uh, Puerto Rico is like Glasgow was in the 1970s. There was nothing there, so anyone with any talent left as soon as they could. And people just got out and went to London. In Puerto Rico, everyone goes to America because they've got American passports and they never come back. So there's a constant talent drain. So they, a bunch of artists set up Beta Local, which is a residency space. It's a reading room and gallery space, and it's also a La Practica, a postgraduate MA course in which no one pays, and you and the teachers work out the, the curriculum for the year, each year. And they also do itinerant seminars. Um, but I went there on a residency, and I went there really to see how does a space like that operate today? They've got no money whatsoever. So they raise all their money through meals and parties. Um, these are both recent. I look at them backwards. These are the meals. They just have these meals, and people put money in that jar at the front. And from the money in the jar, they then are able to invite artists over, and they're able to do things, and they're able to finance uh, the course and their life. Um, so it's how to actually start a space that doesn't get anything from anybody and is working to sort of create enough momentum in the city to stop people leaving the country. Um, and then one of them was over for a transmission show, Beatriz Santiago Munoz, and another one is in Glasgow at the moment, uh, Tony Cruz. Um, that's the table with nobody at it. But that's the books. They've got some nice books and hammocks. Uh, that's thing, uh, thing, thing, thing. More things? Thing. That's the flat. It looks really depressing, doesn't it? Um, it's really dark, but you want it to be dark when it's that hot. Uh, lots of mosquitoes, lots of people playing drums and singing. Um, yeah, and that's a quote. You can read that quote at your level. Um, the last thing maybe I was looking at was this guy, Guy Talese. He wrote an essay called Frank Sinatra Has a Cold in 1966. And he's written lots of other essays since. He's one of the great uh, journalists, one of the great new journalists. He creates a different way for people to write journalism from the 60s onwards. And he writes a really nice essay at the back about how he became a writer. And he said he became a writer because his mother had a dress shop. And his father was also a tailor, but it was during the Italian, you know, the Second World War. So his father kept in the back and did the tailoring, but his mother sat at the front. Women would come get dresses, but they would sit and talk all the time. They're getting the dresses made. And he said he learned how to interview from his mother because his mother was just beautiful asking the right question, and then people would just open up and tell everything. So all the gossip, all the sort of sexual lives of everyone in that kind of you know, borough were all coming out through the dress shop. And his mother knew exactly when to ask something and when to stop, and then leave the silences and let people fill the silences. Don't interrupt people when they're having a silence and ask another question. Sit there for 20 minutes, and then eventually they tell you everything, more than you ever wanted to know. Um, so he learned how to interview from that. And from that, then, he learned how to write in a different way. And so he puts it all down to his mother's dress shop. But actually, it's not just his mother's dress shop. It's the lessons in listening from his mother's dress shop that's useful. 
Um, which kind of brings me back to mediumship. In the mediumship classes I go to, it's all about listening to the person. And actually, if you listen to the person you're talking to, they tell you all of these things, even their body tells you all of these things that they don't know they're revealing. And then you sort of give them the message back and they go, my God, how did you know that? Basically, they told you, uh, but they don't know they told you because they're sending out signals all the time. People are always sending out signals. They don't know it. It's why the police want to interview you sitting like that where they can see your legs, because you lie from your feet up. You can't lie very well with your feet. You can lie better with your face. So they like to see the entire body so they can tell how you're lying and they can actually sort of pay proper attention to you to see what you're really saying, not what you think you're saying. So it's all about the more you listen like that, the better you can collaborate. And it's not about, oh, they're saying this and I'm so nice and I'm listening. It's like they're assholes and you're listening and you're really hearing what they're saying. They go, that's a wonderful idea. And you go, you hate it but you know because you're listening. Um, and so it's about listening well enough to actually hear when things are going well, when they aren't going well, how to collaborate, what to do, where to stop, where to push forward. But it's all about learning to listen to do that. So I think that's about it. Yeah. Thanks.